So, hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of In Conversation With. My name is John Lunn, aka Johnny Chips, and in this video series we talk all things cloud with experts and advocates across the industry covering vast array of topics from skills and careers through to technical how-to and personal thoughts and opinions. So whether you're watching this on YouTube, Twitch, Twitter or LinkedIn, thanks for tuning in and please do take part in the chat, drop a comment, like and subscribe to the channel, it really is appreciated. Okay, so businesses that are looking to leverage cloud services We'll hear the concept of modernizing business applications as a term. It's kind of spoken about quite a fair amount at the moment. So what does that actually mean? You know, what are the benefits to modernizing those applications? How do we start along this journey of app modernization? And what does it actually mean in practical terms? So we will be discussing this and more with my next guest. He is an Azure architect working at Intercept based in the Netherlands. He's an Azure MVP, he's a blogger, a vlogger, and a public speaker. So I'm super excited to welcome my next guest on In Conversation With as Mr. Wesley Harkman. Hey, Wesley, how you doing? Hey, John, I'm good. How are you? No, really good. Thank you very much. And yeah, thanks so much for joining me. Great thank to finally have you on the show and say hello properly. Yeah, thank you for having me. We've been chatting quite a lot on Twitter, on socials, and uh, happy to be here. Oh, great. No, like I say, thanks again for joining me. Yeah, you're right. I think social media has played a huge part of all our lives over the last 18 months or so. And uh, obviously, just before we start this video, we were talking about how everything seems to be slightly getting back to a little bit of normality with a few business trips back to the office. And, you know, not sure how I feel about that. Yeah, I don't know about you, Wesley. Yeah, I, I like going to the office. I, I like being social with my colleagues, but I do have well, not reservations, maybe just getting used to, you know, I like, I like my, my sweatpants at home. I like not having to wear shoes and now you have to go to the office and need to wear shoes, need to have proper trousers. Uh, well, it's a bit getting used to it. And then the interaction, you know, it's just, it feels like new again. That's yeah, no, you're right. I think it's just getting used to what we used to do. But uh, but anyway, look, we, we're here. We've got a couple of little areas we're going to talk around, you know, sort of app modernization, things like that. But look, before we jump straight on in and kind of get into those discussions, I don't know if you want to give yourself a little bit more of an introduction. Maybe talk to us about how you, you know, came to be in the position that you're at now, Wesley, if you don't mind, in, you know, as a cloud architect. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, that's good. So... Wesley, obviously, Wesley Hackman, you pronounced it really well. Kudos for yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> really good, really good, really good. Um, so yeah, how I got to be the ad interest, well, this is actually my second or the second company I'm working for in my career. I started out as an, uh, as an intern at a healthcare organization, uh, managing the Novell and Linux stuff. And I was, I was 17, started as an intern, it was great. Rolled into it more and more, system administration. Um, then I met Rini, the uh, founder of Intercept, and uh, mm -hmm. that is how it happened. That is how I joined Intercept. I started as actually not in a technical role. I did a uh, uh, business IT and management study, a bachelor's degree. So I, I achieved that, joined Intercept, and first I actually did business consultancy. So I was focusing on helping healthcare companies use the public cloud so writing the use case why would you do it um what are the benefits for healthcare companies um, putting that all into a good business case and sell it to management no tech stuff whatsoever and then we did azure azure service manager maybe you remember it the traditional mm -hmm. classic azure with uh with its all its beauties and limitations and then microsoft launched azure resource manager and we thought we need to, we had this one customer, we, we deployed everything, our first big Azure customer, everything Azure Service Manager, and then Microsoft deployed Azure Resource Manager. So I got into it with we need to see how can we migrate that customer to Azure Resource Manager because there, there was no migration path. It was, mm. right, this is the new version of Azure. Enjoy, people, enjoy. And so we, we figured out a methodology to do that and eventually migrated them to Azure Resource Manager. And that's when I got back into tech. I used to do system administration, did some information management for about one, two years, 
then got back into tech with Intercept, and I've been here for seven years now, slowly from consultant to, to architect. No, absolutely. I mean, it's a cool journey. I think it's it's fair to say that the the industry is rife at the moment. You know that I think you know from a uh, an IT pro and an IT sort of a professional expert, if you want to call us that. You know that the industry seems to be screaming out for those kinds of people at the moment. I don't know how you're finding it, but um, it's such a hot area. You know, I, and look, we know IT is very cyclical in the way that it tends to operate. But yeah, you've, are you finding the same things at the moment, Wesley, in terms of actually finding people? Yes, it's very hard to find people. It's very hard to find good people, but um, I always tend to look for the most motiv- motivated people, uh, people with a passion. Sure. I think those are the people you want. You want in your company, and you can teach them everything. Uh, what I find hardest is the the ever evolving technologies. Even for myself, I started with an IT ops background, doing infrastructure, doing VMware, Hyper V. Mm-hmm. Then started doing virtual machines on Azure, and now we do. We'll talk about it later about app modernization, all that stuff. But now, if I if I want to communicate with a customer, I am talking with developers. I'm talking with software architects. I'm talking to lead developers. I now need to understand the concepts of development. Whereas many years ago, I could just tell them, "Hey, we we got that virtual machine. Let's move it to Azure." And now, I need to understand software architecture and it's one thing finding the people that can build architectures or design environments. The other thing, and that's the biggest challenge, is finding people that can go with that, that growth and go with that journey and also keep, keep improving themselves. That is, uh, that is very hard to do. Yeah, I'm with you. And I guess it's one of those things as well is trying to find those people that can do that. But, you know, sometimes, like you say, with the explosion of, you know, different ways of doing things and different terminology, sometimes, I don't know about you, but it's hard to keep up with, you know, which is going to be the next big thing? Which direction should we be going? And, you know, and, and not only doing that for our own individual growth as as experts and consultants or whatever we may be in this industry, but how do we consult with customers and, and kind of answer and address some of those questions with customers so i mean it's you know it's really interesting when it comes to kind of businesses looking to make that shift to the cloud you know because you know as, as we've just alluded to there there's a whole plethora of things that the customer could do i mean how do you tend to start it with your customers wesley in terms of you know you've got a a, a customer i mean today it's it's always very difficult to find a customer that has not done something with the cloud but you know, specifically, they're they're looking they're early doors on their cloud journey, so to speak. You know, yeah. do you follow any guidance? Do you follow follow any frameworks? Is there anything you know, kind of the first passes that you t- tend to speak to customers around? You know, shifting to the cloud. Yeah, so so I really like the cloud adoption framework and specifically the examples of drivers on why would you move to the cloud. Uh, I also I'm also looking for the. Well, one for the motivations, but I also want it to be technology driven. I and with technology driven, I mean not sales or commercially driven. Um, I always try to push that internally, and that's the kind of company we are as well. So don't try to find a problem to a solution you already have. Right? You want to find a solution for whatever the customer is facing. And I really like to not talk about tech the first couple of times with the customer, the first couple of minutes, actually. I, I send them a surf, survey, I have a call with them, and actually ask them, so what What do you do as a business? And what do you want to achieve short term and what do you want to achieve long term? And what, what does your business look like? Do you have enough developers? Do you have, um, do you have the right skills in-house? Because if you look at those frameworks, I love the frameworks, but if you follow all the guys, the reference architectures, then you can easily go to a customer and go, right, you're now running with SQL on-prem, with virtual machines, with IS. That's very beautiful. You need to rewrite everything and do app service and Cosmos to be Azure functions. That is, I sometimes see that happen um, in the market. But then you're not understanding the customer's business because what, what you need to understand is that they have a business to run. They have a backlog of items they need to work on. They have customers that have feature requests. You cannot expect them to drop everything, develop for a couple of months, not add value to their product. And then in six months time, hey, we've got a new version of the product. That means that you lost six six months of listening to your customers and doing what your customers want. So 
I really wanted to be practical and I wanted to work for the customer. Yeah, no, and, and, and that, you know, that, that kind of resonates a lot with, you know, what I'm seeing over here in the UK with the customers I work with. It's, you know, I take, you know, obviously customers are different across, across different verticals, different industries and sectors, you know, large and small. But fundamentally, you know, the principles of moving to the cloud, like you said, I think you mentioned there, those motivations, what are you looking to get out of moving to the cloud? I mean, there's not a lot of things, you know, generally it's either financially driven, it's about innovation and they want to kind of leverage cloud technologies. And and I suppose that the, the area that we talked about there with helping customers on their migration journey, in particular, sort of application modernization is is a term that, you know, I, I hear on a daily basis, I speak with my customers around on a daily basis. And I think it's one of those terms that, from my experience, can be quite an open term and mean different things to different people. So I thought it would be a cool area for, for us to chat around, Wesley, if, if that's all right. And, you know, get your take on it. Because, you know, I know that you you probably work with a lot more sort of software development companies. Do you mind picking up on that, Wesley, in terms of, you know, you know, like I say, with, with different industries, you know, of course, there's not going to be a one size fits all. But what does, you know, can we start on that point when it comes to application modernization? Can, can you break that down for us from your perspective? What does that mean in terms of, um, you know, what is it? What is application modernization and why would we want to do it? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Uh, when I engage with a customer and, uh, and we probably had a sales meeting or commercial meeting with them before and then the customer goes, well... Your colleague says we need to do app modernization, but I'm working on my app for a couple of, couple of years. Working on your backlog and, and implementing new features is not app modernization, right? The app modernization is more, you're thinking more about innovation. And if we discuss that with a customer, usually what I look for is a couple of things. Are you being hold back or limited by your software architecture? Are you being limited by your um, by your technology stack, are you being limited by the platform you're using on? So let's say as a customer, you want to skill, you want to provide your solution globally and you're now running in a local data center. So that is an example where the platform you're using right now, which is maybe the Hyper-V or VMware at the data center, is going to be the thing that's holding you back. So you need to modernize that. You need to modernize to a new platform. But you can also modernize to a new software architecture. Maybe you're using some monolithic solution, which can be fine. I always find the word monolithic a bit, it sounds a bit negative, but there are many reasons why you might want a monolithic application. Uh, but maybe you want to go to a more microservices kind of architecture than a public cloud, like Microsoft Azure will be a really good platform for you to use. And that's what I mean when I talk about app modernization, not just about adding new features, it's about innovating and actually making a difference and, and opening up new business opportunities. Yeah, no, and, and you know, you touched upon a few of those kind of, um, you know, I, I keep using the word new to a lot of to, to a lot of things, but look, things like, um, you know, containerization used in microservices and Kubernetes mm -hmm. services, they, they, they're They've been around for a, a significant number of years now, but to a lot of businesses, those kind of technologies are new technologies. So when it comes to app modernization, I think from the perspective that I talk to customers, sometimes it's that, like you suggested there, what are we doing? Are we are we kind of constrained in that traditional infrastructure-based, you know, physical kit tin data center that, you know, it's we've got to spend you know a significant amount of money on capital to kind of upgrade that whether it's a new san more disk space more compute power you know shift into the cloud is about that you know effectively that elastic scale isn't it it's that ability to kind of consume the power and scale of the cloud so i picked up on that was your first point that's what you meant i'm assuming <laughs> is that you know, you're going from that constrained private environment into a cloud where you kind of got everything um, you know, at your disposal. I mean, are there any, you know, sort of different ways of thinking when we move to the cloud from your point of view, Wesley, when we move into that cloud services, when we've been used to dealing with kind of capital expenditure and, you know, buying bits of infrastructure and kit and tin, how does our mindset have to shift when we move to the cloud in those terms? Well, you're going to a, a pay-per-use model, right? It's it's no longer sure. doing the investment that you have to work on for the next couple of years. You, so first, it's the right timing. 
you need to have the right timing to 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 move to a public cloud um, to not waste your investment and that is these days that's typically hardware um, if you look at licenses so sql licensing you've got hybrid benefit on Azure, so microsoft took care of that even if you've got licenses on prem there are ways to use them in the cloud if you bought the right licenses but um yeah i typically like to just select all the different workloads so you have a, well, you're in contact with the customer. You've got the, um, I think it's called the four or five R's. It's um, rehost, yeah, refactor, sure. rearchitect, rebuild. Um, yeah. Rehost re might might be move and improve. I like that term as well. Um, but you need to explain the customer for each and every workload what that's going to mean financially. And it doesn't mean that you need to have it right up to the last cent. It can be, you know, it, not ballpark figure, it has to be accurate, but you need to explain to the customer, this is what's gonna happen for each and every workload. And the reason why you wanna look at each and every workload or, or separate into different workloads is not just because of the technology. Good example is, can we do MS SQL and move it to Azure SQL? That will be one workload, but then maybe the front end can still has to run on a virtual machine or, or vice versa. Um, it's not just about that, it's also about not wasting the investment. So you need to explain to the customer that part of your investment is not something you have to invest in in three years again to buy a license about hardware. That's now going to be pay per use. And mm. it's pay for what you use and pay for what you forget to turn off. You always need to explain to the customer. Yes. I, was, I got that I got that quote from, from my colleague Gregor. He likes to tell people, right, you pay for what you yeah. use and what you forget to turn off. But you really want to get that in between the ears of the customer. Yeah, yeah. Because if you don't explain that, they will go, all right, the cloud is way too expensive. So you need to sometimes just come up with an Excel going, this is what you're paying now. This is what your investment looks like. And maybe the investment lasts for three years. So this is what it would cost to run as a SQL for three years. And what is really important, it doesn't have to be cheaper, right? A customer can move to the cloud, not just for financial reasons, but also because they want to stay ahead of the competition. They want to be scalable. They don't want to worry about backup. They want more compliance. You need to write down all those benefits for them so they can make the right choices, not just about finances. And, and yeah, just to pick you up on that point you said there, Wesley, in terms of those, you know, four, five, six, seven hours, I, I've seen lots of different flavors from lots of different companies and different cloud providers. They've got fundamentally it's a hook that you're going to do something with a workload. Now, you know, I think traditionally it's probably fair to say we we used to talk about servers an awful lot, didn't we? We used to in this traditional sense, we'd be. Feeding and feeding and watering these things called servers, and you know if one of them went offline, you know if we hadn't invoked some kind of a decent level of HA, mm -hmm. we would be running around with our hair on fire, wondering why our precious server now has, has gone offline. Now, when we shift that into the cloud mentality, that 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 like you said there, that whole shift to now we're paying per use and paying for what we actually use. Actually, now the size of that VM, the, the compute power of that VM, it kind of is within a business's you know, best interest to kind of get that right and get that workload mm -hmm. running in an optimal position. So, I mean, do you see those kinds of tweaks and changes as being part of this app modernization piece, Wesley? You know, is, there, is there much merit in, in those things, do you think? I, I think when it comes to virtual machines, then, and yes, it's still a bit tricky because if you look at what they're doing on-prem, um, they, there's, there's different, uh, well, those servers are built different. The stuff you get on Azure is like, this is the memory, this is CPU, but it's less overhead, it's, it's way more optimized, so maybe you don't need as much memory as you thought you did. But what I see mainly in the benefits of those, those virtual machines, when it's about not having to take care of the server anymore, there's usually two reasons, or one big benefit is like, Auto manage VM or update management, and you don't have to worry about all of that anymore. It's just it's there for you. That's that's a huge benefit. If you go to the average customer that is managing their own data center, I promise you, you will find outdated stuff. It it is mm -hmm. a yeah. big chance you will find outdated stuff, and sometimes up to a level where they're like, well, we really don't want to run that update anymore because we don't know if it'll come back up. 
And then we've got that traditional bare metal DPM server that might be able to take care of the restore process, but we're also not that sure. It gives you so much reliability. It gives you so much control and and trust and comfort. And you'll go to bed on Friday a bit better than, than if you were having to take care of those traditional servers. But then another thing, I work with software companies. We only do software companies. So we only, our customers are all software companies. They a lift and shift from virtual machines to Azure, even if they've got a client server application and you've got things like Azure Virtual Desktop, that is a great, great solution for them. Because one of their biggest challenges is other than that they want to modernize that client server app to some web-based thing or app services, it takes a lot of investment, takes a lot of time. So in the meanwhile, something like Azure Virtual Desktop will take away the dependency of that local IT department. Because if you if you are a software company, you've got 150 customers and you're running client server application with, with AD integration or, or whatever, that means that you need to deal with 150 IT departments. That means that you've got potentially 150 customers going, it doesn't perform well, where you can't control that. Whereas if you run it yourself and you manage that infrastructure as a service yourself, you can build the customer for the consumption if you want to do that, or you've got another pricing model and you're no longer dependent on that local IT infrastructure. So you take away a big, big pain for yourself. So that's that's what I see happening a lot. Yeah, no, that makes sense. No, absolutely. I think, um, like you say, just that control, that control and scalability to, you know, and the performance metrics and measurements of whatever it is that, you know, that business happens to be doing. It's, um, you know, it's certainly, you know, I'm not suggesting it's a one size fits all. It never, it never is in my experience yeah. at all, you know, with, with whatever it is. But it's just, it's kind of trying to break down some of those barriers, I find, with what does one customer understand um, their digital transformation story is? What does the app modernization piece actually mean to that customer? And, and you're kind of back to what you suggested earlier, that that whole, right, what are your motivations? What do you, what are you looking to get out of it? Is there some training that we have to do with, with customers? You know, are all customers fully aware of the capabilities and, and the, the vision that the cloud could possibly give? You know, what, what's your views on that, Wesley, in terms of where companies are today? I think that in the last two years, companies have progressed a lot when it comes to a vision on public cloud, on public infrastructure. Um, whereas before that, that, the cloud was scary and you had competitor, co competitive MSPs or many service providers going, no, we, we have our own data center and it's better to go to a data center because that Azure thing, well, it's the United States government can access your data. That was a big thing for a while. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I think a lot of companies got over that, but you still need to have, you still need to train them on what it means to go to public and what it can do for you. So you don't. If you look at business motivation, I once had a customer that went, "Yes, I need to go to the to Azure." I said, "Why?" They said, "Because we canceled the contract with our data center partner." I said, all right. So, you know what, so, Wesley, you, yeah. you, you wouldn't believe the number of customers that I've been in that exact scenario. It seems to be a common, <laughs> yeah, we don't want to pay for that anymore. We need to move to cloud. Yeah, sorry. Go on. Go on, Wesley. Yeah. Yeah. That, well, exact. That that happens. Um, not too much, luckily, but it happens. And first, you want to tell the customer, well, that's probably not the reason why you should go to the cloud, but we're happy you're doing it. We're happy to have you as a customer, but then we still want to look into you. What are your other motivations? And yeah. sometimes they just don't know. So you start asking them questions like, what are your short-term goals? What are your long-term goals? Do you want to provide your product globally? Do you have customers in the United States? Do you have customers in Australia? If that's a yes, then all right, that, that could be a reason to do it. Um, do you have issues with deployment? Do you, do you spend a lot of time doing IT ops? Because we're all IT ops people, but mainly what we do these days is automating IT ops. So we're more into the automating part of the business yeah, than yeah, yeah. actually. So we, you can help them with that. You can take away over. And it doesn't mean that. So what I really don't like to tell a customer is, all right, we, we can automate your IT ops. That will be big benefit. It's easier in the cloud. We can do Azure DevOps. We can do GitHub. We can do GitHub Actions. And it's easier if you do that deployment to Azure because it integrates so well. That doesn't mean that you can fire your system administrators that, that 
that that's not how you should start a conversation with a customer. Like they, it's not true that they no longer have a job. That's sometimes what you hear from from companies like we want to go to yeah, the cloud, yeah. we want to outsource our large part of our ops um, because that that will save me personal costs. That is not true. That is that's a big myth. Mm -hmm. What you want them them to do is train them in the public cloud. You can still have a partner where you can bounce ideas off. You can still buy in many services because who wants to look at a monitor with all the telemetry every day? Nobody wants to do that. Or at least I, I don't want to, and I know a lot of people don't want to do that. You want to train them to focus on automating more, more the DevOps kind of path or route they should take. Because then for, for a long, long time, the IT ops department at, at customer at companies are seen as something that's costing you money, right? They don't see it as a trigger or a possibility of, for innovation. If you free them up and you take away those, those dull tasks, you can free them up. You can give them time to actually do and, and participate and add value to the product by doing DevOps or faster deployments or helping customers the way customers need to be helped instead of looking at all the telemetry, swapping out a disk and all that stuff. So I think it's, it's an enabler for innovation as well, going to that. And that's the story you need to get across to the customer and hopefully to the ops people as well. No, no, I 100% agree. I think that that certainly, for, from my perspective, to a lot of customers I was dealing with was, you know, back to your point, it was always a, you know, we've got a traditional data center, we just want to go to cloud service. And they were very much sure that, you know, I say I'm massively generalizing now, but, but the majority of customers, in my opinion, over the last few years have seen it in that sense. Certainly COVID, you're right, COVID has certainly been that realization i think to the industry hugely that that actually some of this stuff is within reach and, and it is yeah. maybe not as difficult uh, as, as you might think but the one thing that i found a lot of is um i don't know where it's come from or how it's come to be well i like kind of do in a way but when you speak to people about cloud i don't know what your take is but lots of people seem to think that it's really simple and straightforward and easy i mean what's your view on that wesley is cloud simple straightforward and easy you know well, or is there something more to it no that, that well i think there's way more to it but i get that i hear that story as well sometimes you have that one customer's like well we can do it ourselves and yes if you want to do virtual machines and host it on azure that then what you see them ending up with i'm not saying that also really generalizing here but what you see happening most of the time is they're putting those vms in azure maybe do some azure site recovery azure migrate all beautiful and then in two years' time, they're still running virtual machines. And if yeah. you actually look at what they're doing, is they are still managing those virtual machines as if they were managing an on-prem environment. So what I like to tell them is, right, you're using Azure, but you're not using Azure. Mm. You're doing cloud, but you're not really doing cloud. You're just hosting your stuff somewhere else. If you look at the capabilities of cloud, and I think all the technology experts and, and enthusiasts out there will, will acknowledge that, it's so difficult to keep up. There are so many technologies. If you, I think a good example is um, why it's not easy. Let's say you're running that web server locally and developers are writing stuff and they're writing some stuff to disk locally, which is fine. Then they go, well, let, let's look at app services. And then what we have to tell them, and they are not aware of that. So they think it's easy, but then they start doing that app. So they just grab that .NET framework or .NET Core, ASP.NET Core app, put it on app service. I'm like, yeah, I can't do the scaling thing horizontally. I can't add into this because uh, I'm storing some kind of state. And that's where we come in and tell them, well, you need to learn that in a cloud, there are different components. Everything is a different resource. So you might need a storage account. You need to implement the storage SDK. You need to use blob storage and you need to write your images to that storage account and you need to have retry logic in your code because you will have to design well designing for failure sounds really negative but instead of writing to a local disk you're now writing over an https connection to a different resource so you need to have the logic for that and if you build that it's going to be the most epic and fastest application you've ever built but a lot of people don't know that so they think cloud is easy until they run into that stuff and then they come back and go well those app services don't perform really well so i think as as experts and as many service providers, CSPs, everyone working with the cloud, 
it is our responsibility to teach the customer that it is different. It is different technology. It's hard to keep up. And once they understand, and there's also a commercial driver behind that, they will come back and bounce ideas of you because they actually need you. If you look at, well, you've been working with Azure for quite some time, you work with it every day. You probably don't know everything about every resource. I don't know everything no, about every resource. Yeah, but we're working with teams that are investing a lot of time in learning about those technologies. And that is our job. And at a customer, the ops department, it is not their job. They want to keep the product running. So they will really quickly learn that they need help, which is also really good for us. But uh, it, it's the way we need to teach customers. It is definitely not easy. Yeah, no, I think that's that's probably what I, you know, that, that's very similar view to, to what I hold at the moment. I think, you know, certainly, you know, going back to those monolithic applications of, uh, you know, of the, of, I, I say the past, they're not the past, they're still there. But, you know, certainly when we move those into more kind of either SaaS models or we, we move them to more modernized, you know, kind of multi-tiered kind of PaaS offerings within a cloud platform, you know, those traditional applications, it was kind of easy to kind of just say, well, there we go. We've gone and deployed a, a server with a particular version of that application on it. See you in six months, uh, you know, do your patch and see you in six months in, or two or three years' time, and we'll upgrade it for you. And and you're right; it's it's certainly not like that. If you're going to start to you know leverage the the capabilities of of the cloud as 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 they are you know today, and and like you say, trying to keep up with that is such a is no easy task. And you know, I think I don't know. Sometimes is it is it a bit of a marketing term that people say, oh, it's easy in the cloud or misconceptions maybe it's back to your point around you know our business is just looking to kind of move their IaaS estate and manage it in much the same way as they would a traditional data center these are all things I completely agree that that you know we, we we're all learning and have been learning over the last few years together and certainly customers I work with are learning that for themselves now as well so I mean in in terms of that whole application modernization piece, then then Wesley, you know, I think we've established that it is a multifaceted kind of term. You know, it can it can mean many things to to many people. But I mean, would you would you what would you say is is the main crux of what customers need to understand? What are the key takeaways for what application modernization is? And I know we've touched upon them um, over the last you know sort of few minutes of conversation. But what would they be from your point of view? I think it would be to understand that your software architecture is not the thing that's going to last for 10 years. It's th that's, that's important. It's, it's identifying your limiting factors. It's going to be platform, finances, or, or your software architecture, technology stack. And I think it's always going to be, I don't think there's ever going to be a general consensus on what app modernization really is. Um, if you find a lot of definitions out there, <laughs> I think it's about using, making the right choices to drive innovation with, with your application. So that can be that software architecture, can be the technology. And what I think as many service providers or as consultancy companies or as Azure specialists, it is our responsibility once you move that customer to the cloud to keep them up to date and to keep helping them. I really have a lot of conversations with customers and, and it's not just about, hey, customer, can you please do that? It's you move them to the cloud and it can be partially app modernization going from, uh, from IIS to app services and still running that MS SQL VM because you're doing some, some sketchy stuff in your database, that's fine. You want to modernize that at some point. But you need to you need to keep in contact. You need to keep in touch with the customer, and you need to keep helping them. And you need to explain to them that at some point, because a lot of customers before I'm going to that, a lot of customers are like, "Well, let's modernize the platform." But that's not app modernization is mm. way more. Right? App modernization is way more than just the platform. So you yeah. want to explain to the customer, and that can be really tough conversations. Like, hey. We can do all this on a platform and on infrastructure level for you, but at some point, your software architecture is going to be the limiting factor. If you want more, you need to start rewriting code. You need to start embracing the features of the cloud. So you need to start using Key Vault. You need to start using Azure AD. You need to start using Cosmos DB. I don't know, mm -hmm. but you need to rewrite parts of your application to, to keep up. And then 
app modernization will be a continuous process for, for many years to come. It's not just do it now and wait for 10 years, because what's going to happen is you're going to be in the same situation that you are now, but 10 years ahead. Yeah, you again. know, I, I I was speaking with a guest on the show, uh, you know, a few weeks back about this this new term that that I kind of had, had kind of heard once or twice, but not really paid too much of, of attention to. But this concept, I don't know if you've heard about it, but this concept of on cloud. So rather than an application being designed and developed for an on prem installation, you know, certainly software companies, and you know, I'm no software developer, but with you working with you know predominantly software companies, are you seeing that more and more now that that Actual software companies are building their, okay, if it's a SaaS application, then we understand it will be hosted somewhere and run and subscribed and logged in from by business users. But are you seeing them, that concept of on-cloud where businesses are now developing applications that can be literally deployed into a customer run and you know, paid for tenant or subscription, but you know it's almost like deployed as infrastructure as code directly on-cloud for a particular customer to then you you know much in the same way that we might have installed traditional applications back in you know the traditional sense yes i do see that i actually got a couple of customers who prefer to do it like that and that's hmm. um a big reason for that is also the so if you've got a software company they've got end customers i usually call them end customers um they have requirements like if they're big enterprises then they usually want it to run in their environment, their subscription. So they need to yeah. provide some kind of technology to deploy. The infrastructure as code being a great solution. I think the better alternative is doing it if you want to stay native to, to Azure, is going to be something like the Azure Marketplace. Mm -hmm. And up until Inspire this year, that was definitely not the best idea because Microsoft <clears throat> does take a large cut of the, um, of the bill. But that changed, and it's being made easier and easier to use Azure Marketplace. And now, and, and that way, you can do things like managed apps. You can have the customer click on it, deploy it to their subscriptions running in their environment. But you still are being projected with the right permissions to manage that solution. So you can still have some kind of control. I think we're going to see a lot of that in the future now that Azure Marketplace is becoming more accessible. So. Not so much now, but I do see a lot of that happening in the future. Yeah, no, absolutely. And maybe maybe we'll use this as a poignant point to pivot on our conversation then, Wesley. So, I mean, just to summarize what we talked around in, in you know, hopefully that's been of use to anybody watching this video now. But, but certainly, I, I suppose, like you say, there's no clear cut and dried answer to what application modernization is. I like the way that you summed it up earlier on, which was basically that that realization to benefit your business and how you can innovate, you know, for, for that particular business, how they can embrace innovation. Um, so, I mean, on that point, Wesley, in terms of innovation, I know and I've seen across social media, you've been following similar paths to me with, you know, kind of looking at IoT and things like that. I mean, what are your thoughts on on things like IoT and, and you know, and, and business uptake of those kinds of solutions, especially with, you know, the explosion of cloud services? Um, you know, where do you stand on that front and, and what are you seeing at the moment in that space? I, uh, well, I absolutely love IoT, started out as a hobby, um, but uh, we do it for customers as well. I think the IoT has a really, really big future. It is, for me, it is one of those technologies that, that can make a difference. So um, whereas we can deploy the virtual machines, the app services, um, at the end of the day, what difference did you make for society, right? Other than you did a really good job, you made a customer really happy. But you see with IoT, I've been working with a customer that they use IoT to do measurements in Africa to provide power to people. So what kind of power grid, like small power grid, do they need to build? They use apps on phones that, that the community there uses, makes pictures, put in data. Um, then they build a small power grid to help uh, a couple of houses with, with energy. And they measure that and they control that with IoT. I'm like, that that kind of thing is where technology makes a difference in people's lives. And I think that is that is more often the case with IoT and uh, possibly AI than any other technology. So that is why I'm really excited about it. And I see that a lot of people are starting to get into it, a lot of business starting to get into it. Sure, you've got the, the smart cities, the smart houses, and 
I think everyone, if, if you go around your house, you probably have some IoT, IoT stuff running without you knowing it, but you can actually use those technologies to make a difference. That That's what excites me. That's why I got into it. No, and, and do you know what? I think the one one of the observations that I found now, and it's great, you know, if, if you're of the, you know, the kind of the technical slant, you, you like to dabble with things like, you know, Alexa or Google Home or, you know, s smart light bulbs and light strips. And like you say, the smart, smart homes, that's great. But I mean, they, there's, there's still a lot of tech there that kind of needs to be strung together. I mean, you know, I'm I'm seeing that. And one of the things that I'm finding with, with IoT is certainly in the business case that, Yes, we've got those point solutions, much like we can go out and buy, you know, a set of lights for our house and plug them in. And we've got an app on our phone. We can control those lights. Um, then we can go and buy an Alexa. And yes, we can get the Alexa to hook into that app. But there's still a lot of that glue that needs to go in to kind of join in those solutions together. I mean, you know, what are your thoughts on that in terms of, you know, if you if we were to move that into the business sense, you know, that whole at the minute, I feel sometimes we're looking to join the dots together for companies to offer a solution that can then go into operations and be managed properly. And, you know, I'm seeing, yes, there are point solutions out there, but I'm certainly seeing there's huge opportunity for, you know, like you say, that innovation, that, that kind of heartfelt innovation, doing something meaningful, you know, not just selling something for the sake of selling something, but actually using these technologies now to... You know, when I think of it, my mind goes, poof, you know, there's so much opportunity. It's about that creative, what can we do to kind of help things? So, I mean, that was a meandering thought there, Wesley. But, I mean, in terms of what IoT for businesses means at the moment, how, what, what's your view on that? You know, are we, have we got mature products at the moment? Uh, you know, is there, is there gaps to fill? Where do you think we are at the moment in that, in that front? I think there are a lot of gaps to fill. Um, because well, you and I, lots of other people, we're able to stitch those parts together and, and make a viable solution. But it's not that, it's not as plug and play as we need it to be yet. So we, yeah, sure. And what what, what it make what makes it more difficult for for the experts and the consultants working with IoT is you're no longer looking at just the servers and the apps. No, you're actually looking at someone is developing a piece of hardware. And there needs to be code on that. And that can be on the opposite side of the world, whereas I'm in the Netherlands, you're in the UK. How are we going to do that? Are we going to train those people? Are we going to help them with that? I think Microsoft made a lot of huge leaps with IoT Hub and the provisioning and, and mm. automating deployment to IoT devices. But I still think there's a lot to be done on the device level to make it easier there are a lot of different technologies out there so when you get your device certified um what clouds you're gonna hook it up to do you want it to be microsoft azure certified the iot certified device yes or no and does that have a benefit i've had customers come to me like and ask me would that be beneficial for me and i'm like well i don't know i'm just there's no it's still it's still a very very young market that mm. it needs to um it needs to mature, and I think it's up to us to provide the right input to help that market mature. Yeah, I agree, and I and I like you know I like the fact that you you kind of see it, and again in a very similar sense that that I see things, and you can kind of see the strides that Microsoft have made, and things like that that kind of almost that universal plug and play into a cloud platform of an IoT device. You know, certainly mm -hmm. you know things like IoT Central, and you know there are strides to make that happen and there are devices there now that are kind of going along those those lines which is really you know i find it really exciting to like you say back to the point that you raised there about iot being able to you know glue those solutions together to, to actually start to to you know give answers and give solutions for, for real world problems and you know in, in from a completely different perspective as well you know there's so many examples that i've heard that just make you think wow I wouldn't have even thought of, you know, using tech to answer that solution. But um, I mean, you know, to kind of wrap up where we are then, Wesley, I mean, in terms of what I like to do with, with you know, we've talked about IoT and that innovation I picked up around app modernization. It's about getting those businesses to the point where they can innovate for themselves and they can, um, you know, realize their potential, I guess, of their own industry, their own vertical, where that business is and, you know, find their unique selling point, I guess, or find their differentiator in the marketplace is, is a term that, that gets thrown around quite a lot. Um, so, I mean, it's been a great conversation, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with this then. So, so 
where, where are we where are we going Wesley in terms of tech what what are you know your next big bets over the next sort of five to ten years time what what's our job going to look like do you think I think it'll change I think it's going more towards <clears throat> development not everyone but so a couple of years ago such an Adela said everyone's going to be a developer or something along those lines and he's got a point there we're no longer going to do the point and click adventure in azure portal or anything it's even people doing it ops they're developing they are writing scripts they're writing code they're writing infrastructure as code it that to me that is also development i think we're going to do way more of that and it's going to be way less the traditional ops that we're used to we've seen that in the past couple of years where it's going way more towards development. I know you write some code. I started getting into development a couple of years ago just because I wanted to keep up. Um, we're no longer just doing virtual machines, it's gonna be app services. I see serverless is going really, really fast. I see that, that growing. And I think we will see more multi-cloud in the future. I absolutely love Azure, it is my go-to platform. I love it. But I do see customers asking here and there, all right, what if I want to do a multi-cloud? And I don't necessarily want to use the Azure functions because what if I want to do AWS? Then I'm using for a I'm, I'm using a native technology stack native to Azure, but I also want to be able to deploy to AWS. What if Azure doesn't work anymore? And that is no longer a what if question customers are actually asking for it so i think that's my prediction for the upcoming five years there will be a technology not of course you can do it with kubernetes and you can deploy to multi-cloud containers i think there will be a different technology maybe a next version of azure arc or something along those lines that will provide those technologies because it what, feels like that doesn't it? it certainly feels that that, that the i think we have to out for something yeah yeah no, the I thing think. is that I, I see that with kubernetes and, and you know you can run aks you, run, you can run kubernetes on, on aws but then you've got customers going i want to use the key fault but then you're no longer really multi-cloud right because you don't have a key fault on aws so i'm looking for some kind of solution to that question and i think a lot of people are looking for that i i really expect that to be there in 10 years time. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And, you know, to your point around kind of um, everyone's a developer, I know that term, you know, I've certainly, um, I, I get it, completely get it. But I think, you know, the whole term everyone's a developer is, is a bit of a moot point, I think, to a, to, to a certain extent, because I think certainly there are traditional ways that we've worked in the past operationally. And like you say, you know, even in the cloud now, we can work in those same ways. But... Yeah, with the with the acceleration of the you know the development of the cloud fabric itself, you know, and the capabilities, it's kind of s s screaming away from that kind of traditional view of the IT industry. So yeah, I mean, it's going to be cool, and, and I like your your kind of vision there in terms of what what might what might it look like <laughs> for us to actually work with the cloud in in five or ten years time. You know, it's uh, no. arguably arguably going to be completely different to what it is today with with the, with the pace of change that we're. Uh, we're experiencing isn't it so Wesley I mean this has been a, a super fun chat you know thanks so much for coming on and kind of you know helping I get hopefully helping people understand that look this I mean the bottom line is it's not as clear cut and dry as we might mm -hmm. like it to be at the moment the industry is moving yeah. on at such a fast pace that even the experts in the industry you know you know are, are, are in the same boat to a certain extent with trying to keep up to speed with those advances so i mean it's just you know hopefully that will help somebody with their cloud journey before we wrap up you know obviously thank you so much for joining me are there any final parting words of wisdom that you might have for our viewers i i, I like to just do it but that's not not what people should do no but my <laughs> final words is <laughs> understand your customer it's we're no longer in the era of being it cowboys just understand your customer ask them what their goal is and go from there if you didn't have that conversation yet with your customer don't even think about tech that will be it and we'll leave it on that no that's i we'll mean it's a 100 percent agree and it's a completely valid point 
understand what the customer actually needs and what they're trying to achieve. Don't jump in there. <laughs> Don't just yeah. do it as much as sometimes it is too yeah. easy to do, eh? Wesley, it's been super fun to have you on. Thanks so much for giving up your time and uh, recording an episode of this uh, this show with me tonight. Um, yeah, thanks yeah. for joining me, and I will catch up with you very soon over on the socials, no doubt. Definitely. Thanks for having me. It was great. Thanks, Wesley. I'll speak to you soon. Speak soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>